If you can dream it, you can do it. And I would like you to dream a little bit with me and explore a couple of questions. Uh, this is a speculative design. So it means that uh, what we're trying to do is to prototype an experience of what it would be like to live with a hydrogen economy. So here what we represent is that you imagine you have floating solar panels. Under the solar panel we have an electrolyzer. It's basically a tank of water with electrode plus minus. And when we bring electricity into water, it breaks the water into hydrogen and oxygen. H2O goes H to H and O. And so we then store the hydrogen in those balloons and we can transport those balloons to the land and we can use this hydrogen for transportation. We compress the hydrogen, we run it through a fuel cell and power an electric uh, motorbike, electric scooter. Uh, you can also run a fuel cell to have electricity for your house and you can also just burn the hydrogen straight up or mix with LPG. And so all these are things that you use in your everyday life, but that means that from one clean source of energy, potentially you could replace a lot of the things that you would normally use. And what's interesting is that when you burn it, once you burn hydrogen, it just goes back to being water. And so you could do this basically ad infinitum. You could do this forever. And so that sounds too good to be true, right? <laughs> so yeah, so of course, there's a lot of challenges uh, on the way to achieve this. And so uh, this is when the approach of designer can maybe sometime help and be different from what we normally do in the world of, say, science or engineering. It's because we go from the world of, uh, normally from science to fiction, but in our case, we're going to do the opposite. So traditionally, so I'm a designer, typically uh, we have the scientists to make some technological discovery, the engineers who are there to sort of optimize it, and then the designers are there to traditionally make things pretty. But actually, uh, if you think about this approach, it's very top-down, and the consumer is just at the end, and you know, they're not really asked anywhere what, what they feel or what, what they want. And so this is more the new approach, where we first try to understand what the user will need. We try to understand the market first. And then we sort of go backwards. So the design is actually on the front line of listening to the users or the consumer. They become co-creator. We, we are basically creating a scenario. And then eventually we figure out how to make it happen. And so this is a, what's called human-centered design. And if you think about the phone that you have in your pocket, I wonder how many of you have a phone that has buttons. But I'm going to bet it's very few of you. But back then, maybe you remember still, when the first phone came with no buttons, many people were saying, like, are you crazy? You want to make a phone with no buttons? <laughs> and now none of us have buttons in our phone. But it took this kind of boldness and sort of a shift in our mindset. To, you know, to realize, oh yeah, actually we don't need to have buttons, we could do with you know, touchpad. And so what we have here is uh, the opposite. We are going from fiction and we're going for science. And we call this speculative design. And so that's the method that we're using. It means that we are more like a hackers than we are uh, scientists in the way we approach things. So design is not how things look, so that would be the first uh, schema, but it's how they work. And so it requires us to change our mind. And I believe that if we change our mind and our expectation of how te technology functions, then we can change pretty much everything. Um, so the dogma or the idea that is put upon us right now is that the cost of Indonesia to grow is to have more people, more energy. It means that we are destroying more uh, species and more habitat. And you know, we are going to be uh, having more pollution and less biodiversity. It seems that this is almost inevitable. But what if we change our mind and develop technology and design that are basically solving this problem and we just, add, we just uh, as a basis, we just say this is the way we're going to work. What would that look like? So, can we uh, bring hydrogen, which is challenging as a new uh, source of energy in our daily lives and how would that look like? So, the first thing that we're going to talk about is how we're addressing some of the challenges uh, related to hydrogen. When we speak about hydrogen, people will uh, talk about like, this huge challenge. In the next 20, 25 years, we're going to have to quadruple uh, the energy demand for Indonesia. And uh, unfortunately, right now, because of the energy mix that Indonesia has, CO2 emissions are even more than quadrupling, unfortunately. And so, because the energy mix is so um, little uh, having to do with the renewable energy, of course, we're investing a lot in this area, but still not enough uh, to make up for and meet the targets. So, uh, because this first floating balloon that I showed you, we did in Bali, uh, we had a lot of re really interesting response. A lot of people were very excited about the technology, and they asked us, okay, we'll stay in Bali, you're already here, just let's make it better. 
And so we started to look at potential sites. In Bali, we also uh, learned that, uh, because I'm, I was a tourist <laughs> when I just came, that there's so many mangroves. And those mangroves, as a previous uh, TED talk that you listened to, uh, mangroves are really amazing for sequestering carbon. And they can also protect our installation from uh, heavy weather. So they can protect us from, from you know, storms and, and strong waves and so on. So we uh, visited uh, 40 sites, evaluated 15 of them, and narrowed down to those uh, to this location in Serangan. So Serangan is a small island uh, in Bali, uh, and just to south of Danpasar. And this island is really perfect for us because it's a small enough community so that we can make an impact and we'll be able to measure how much good or how much bad we do in a community. Uh, and we started by really uh, getting to know the, uh, the local people. So meeting the chief of the village, the religious figure, also the elders, the fishermen, playing with the children and asking them you know, what their dreams and their fears are. And uh, we came up uh, with this. Um, uh, then we also studied the biodiversity. So before we do anything, we want to make sure that we understand what is there. And we can see that the population is doing even better uh, after we start to work. So, with all this conversation, we started to create the sketch of basically a floating lab. But with the discussion, we realized that the villagers also really want to have a floating classroom. They want this to be an innovation, but also an education, because they want to create opportunity for young people to be trained in renewable energy sector. And so we also came up with this idea of building a website where we'll have a real-time webcam that can tell us what's happening on the platform, but also the, the specific uh, chemical that we are testing to produce hydrogen. So how much sun is reaching the platform and uh, how, much, uh, how we're transforming it into hydrogen. So we would know not only open science, but also do it in real time. So anybody else in the world can you know, compete and collaborate with us. So this is the next step, is that once we have the sketch, sometimes some people are not really good at reading technical drawings. So we make models. And this is probably like model number seven. So every time we go to a village, we get some feedback, we improve. So we're really in these early stages. This is where we are right now. We are looking to build a platform that's 9 meter by 9 meter, uh, basically producing 10 kilowatts of solar. And it's essentially on the left side, mechanical and electric engineering. And on the left side, it's uh, chemistry, sorry, it's biology and chemistry. So in one small space, actually, we can do a lot. And um, when we talk about hydrogen, a lot of people have a lot of criticism, and that's fair. And so people would ask us, for example, yes, renewable, uh, they are nice, but they take so much space. And so I say, OK, what about we are going into the sea, so we don't take any land? Then they would say, oh, yes, but uh, hydrogen is very inefficient. You compress the hydrogen, you lose 40% of the energy efficiency. And you're like, OK, yeah. What about we don't compress hydrogen? What if we just keep it atmospheric pressure so we don't lose all this energy? So it means that just we have big balloons. And that's why people sometimes call me the balloon man. Uh, the third one. <laughs> is uh, uh, people say, yes, but you have to compress it, and compressors are very expensive. They say, what if we don't have compressor? We just put our, we send our electrons on the water, they have those bubbles, and the bubbles come, they're already pressurized. We don't need compressor. Uh, so we also save money and save electricity. Then people say, yes, but uh, even green hydrogen, even from solar, uses uh, all these bad chemicals in the catalyst. And so we actually found a local scientist in Udayana University, Professor Dudiani, and she's actually working on non-toxic catalysts. So byproduct from coconuts, uh, pineapple and tofu manufacturing turns out that they can be good uh, catalysts. So we can actually make almost catalysts that are almost edible, so really non-toxic. The, the other area where we have to work is the biology, of course. If we develop more energy, if it's at the cost of the environment, then maybe we shouldn't do that, right? So we're trying to look at those questions. If you produce hydrogen on the surface, you also produce oxygen. And it turns out that in the mangrove area, the speed of the water is tends to be slow. And because it's urbanized, there's too much nutrients, uh, too much stuff goes there. And so the level of oxygen in the water tends to be low. If you have an aquarium, you know that you need to put a bubbler. You put bubbles, you have oxygen for the fish, the fish happy, you're happy, everybody happy, OK? So if we put more oxygen in the water, actually improve the water quality, improve biodiversity, and retention of carbon in the soil, in the sediment. So just basically having more energy producing hydrogen bring more oxygen on the, on the ground, on the water, that's good for the environment. So we want to see how much we can do. The other things you can see, we are looking to automate planting, uh, make the uh, roots of the mangrove to be holding uh, better, and changing the soil, basically, to uh, make the growing of mangrove faster, 
Of course, it will be very localized, but that's the whole point. We're trying to make a lab that is cheap so that we could build other labs in other locations so they can make their own technology. And the third one is the business. Of course, uh, if we are producing energy, the assumption is that, ah, okay, you guys are some foreign investor, you're going to bring your machines, and you're going to take our natural resource, and you're going to be like another colonizer. Okay? We don't want to do that. <laughs> we want to uh, uh, actually work with local people and develop things locally. And the IP is open source, so other villagers can copy it. And the management will also be managed by the local people, so they will all be also owning it. And by the way, because it's low pressure hydrogen and balloon, it's not very convenient to transport. So actually, it would be a local sort of microgrid kind of system. So the idea is that instead of having one energy company that controls everything, here we're talking about creating localized uh, grids. So generating revenue locally. So, OK, saying, great, it's good for the environment, uh, good for the energy, and then bring business locally. OK, but uh, is this scalable? So that's the idea. Is we want to check that. We don't know if it's scalable. So we've done one kilowatt. Now we are building 10 kilowatts. Uh, but potentially, 90% of the world trade is transported by ship, right? So everything is transported by ship. And if we are able to produce hydrogen offshore, it's very scalable. And uh, there was a recent study uh, just this year that uh, demonstrated that actually, if you look at the place where there's the least big wave or strongest wind, but still have a lot of sun and large uh, space in the water, it turns out that uh, there's two ideal places in the world to do floating solar. One is Indonesia. And the other place is the uh, Gulf of Guinea, uh, basically around Nigeria and Togo and uh, Cote d'Ivoire and those places. So you are basically uh, the best place to do this kind of technology, and that could also be exported. And exported, it doesn't have to be exported far. This is another map of the, con of the cities that will suffer the most from sea level rise and climate change in particular. 99 of the 100 cities that will be most hurt by sea level rise and climate change are in this area specifically really close to Indonesia. So that means that if you develop a solution that is good for production of energy, carbon sequestration, basically it's going to be in demand in this area because this area really needs it the most out of the whole planet as well. So last point is that most of the people who live on the coast, except when they're in the big cities, uh, they are indigenous people. Many of them are fishermen. And actually, those coastal communities, even if they are a small amount of percent of people, they are the people who protect the environment and the ocean the best. 22% of indigenous people uh, protect 80% of biodiversity. So indigenous people are our future. They are protecting nature, which is our uh, common and shared heritage. So we need to work with indigenous people, and they need to own and manage those infrastructure, energy infrastructure, I believe. Lastly, um, uh, hydrogen is uh, the most abundant element in the whole universe. 75% of the universe is made of hydrogen. And so this is a very uh, uh, abundant thing. And so uh, we are uh, looking at those questions in a very candid way. We don't know uh, if we can achieve those goals. But we believe that you know, if we can change our mindset and we can create models where we're producing energy means also producing more protection for the environment, then you know, this is the, the, the right mindset to have. So as you've seen, at the beginning, there was just a simple question. How can we produce green hydrogen in a scalable way? And then it turns out that you open one can of worm, and there's like a thousand other cans of worms inside. And so this is also very exciting. And so even though we don't know uh, if we're going to be succeeding, uh, we believe that these are the hard and uh, important questions to be asked. Thank you very much.